to a very fulsome and uh, positive view, and we are grateful for that uh, overview. Uh, we are going to. Uh, oh, this is the wrong mic. This is another mic. mic. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, as he mentioned, uh, Suzanne Rudolph gave a present. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Other mic. Uh, her presidential address was uh, uh, the uh, the um, imperialism of categories. And we have the subtitle, uh, Situated Knowledge in a Globalizing World, which we'll come to towards the end of the lecture. The way we're organizing the lecture is that Su Suzanne Rudolph will uh, give the first part, and I will give the second part. We're sort of dividing it up, uh, as we have so many times in our lives. And so she will begin, and I will follow her after that. Just a Wait a minute, let's get her set up there. Our objective was to conduct a survey on political consciousness. 600 urban and rural Tamils scattered across three districts constituted the random sample we had selected from the first electoral rolls of recently freed India. Vioki that witty and groundbreaking doyen of electoral behavioral analysis had enticed us into survey research. Upon our return, the Michigan Survey Research Center provided a methodologically intense summer. We were part of a wave of comparativist political scientists who had been motivated in the 1950s and 1960s by the proliferation of new nations following decolonization. Gabriel Almond, a senior participant in this move, wrote that political scientists, wrote that political scientists moved into Asia, the Middle East, Africa, Latin America, with all the energy and commitment of pioneers who wanted to be the first to observe these new experiments in politics, or to observe primordial and traditional societies with a curiosity and fascination that we associate with anthropological fieldwork. We had tuned in early to the liberating part of survey research. Survey data freed political scientists from the formalist, legalist approaches that characterized the institutionalism of that time. Survey results told us what the citizens thought they were experiencing and doing it. It gave us access to the electoral behavior and political attitudes that shaped the practical meaning of political institutions. We imagined we were plumbing the true underpinnings of the Indian experiment in democracy. What we had not counted on was that American ideology, American hegemonic Lockean liberalism, would shape the very concepts and methods we used to acquire knowledge about an unfamiliar society and policies. When our bewildered Indian interviewers returned from their first foray into the villages of Tamil Nadu, they complained of a radical disconnect between their training experience, modeled on best US practice of that time, and their field experience. The model for the performance we call an interview placed the interviewer with his clipboard in the kitchen or living room of a suburban home where he could record the personal opinions of the dweller within. A simple two-person interaction between an interviewer and an interviewee. This model highlights the assumptions of methodological individualism that characterize survey research as practiced in the United States. Respondents are singular. They respond one-on-one, -on -one. not so in Tamil villages circa 1957. 
Husbands and fathers, sons and daughters joined in the interview. Responding to a survey question became a matter of collective effort, a veritable group seminar. The experience instructed us that in village India, the individual was not the unit of opinion. Indeed, the singular, private, and personal were alien to the life, life worlds of Indian towns and villages. Opinions, we learned, was collectively formed and often collectively expressed. Survey research also operates with radically... Somebody's whistling. <laughs> oh, well, all is well. <laughs> Worlds of Indian town. Opinion, we learned, was collectively framed and often collectively expressed. Survey research also operates with radically democratic assumptions. An individual's opinion, like an individual's vote, is assumed to have equal importance and equal weight. In 1957, they did not have equal weight, although in succeeding decades, that difference has diminished. Our interviews were conducted at a time when caste hierarchy and patron-client relationships substantially influenced political relationships. Lower castes had not yet realized the leverage their numbers would give them in democratic elections. They soon learned to use their numerical advantage to counter the status and economic power of middle and upper castes. So the local knowledge that we then encountered, that the influence of leading landlords and caste and village headmen shaped village attitudes, opinions, and votes. That was how it was. Our 1957 Madras survey introduced us to the problem of exporting homegrown concepts and methodologic methodologies to alien places, where, as we would say today, the other lives. As Western social scientists in the 1950s began doing research in notions in nations newly liberated from colonial rule after World War II. They brought with them the concepts and methodologies they had developed to do political research at home. I had a sense of mission, wrote Gabriel Allman, the Stanford professor who was soon to become the doyen of comparative politics in the US. I had a sense of mission in bringing to the study of foreign political systems the theoretical ferment and methodological innovation which had already gone far in transforming the field of American political studies. It should not have been surprising or unusual that we came equipped with American concepts and methods to do research in India, among the first of the new nations. They were what was often referred to at the time as our toolkit. They were shut, they were what was often referred to at the time, our means for entering exam complex and unfamiliar non-Western environments. Without concepts and methods, would we have known where to start, where to look, and what to look for? The question was, and still is, and to what extent were those concepts and those methods smithed under American circumstances, amenable to infiltration, adaptation, modification, transformation by the forms of life and the worldviews of the alien other? To what extent were the concepts and methods we brought with us from the United States capable of responding to differences between civilizations, cultures, and worldviews? Could they, in the words of Clifford Geertz, could they penetrate or be penetrated by another form of life? Early in our research in India, we coined the phrase, imperialism of categories, imperialism of categories. It was meant to designate the academic practice of imposing concepts on the other, the export of concepts as an aspect of hegemonic relationships. Categories crafted in the dominant sociocultural environment are exported to a subordinate one. The imperialism of categories entails an unselfconscious parochialism about categories, 
scholars from a society taken by the acolytes to be dominant, sometimes called the center, travel to a distant and lesser place, sometimes called the periphery, where they applied universal concepts. The trouble is that the concepts have been fashioned out of the center's history, out of the center's history, culture and practice. In our case, out of American culture, academic, out of American academic clay. The title of one of Ashish Nandi's essays, The Intimate Enemy, conveyed the cultural violence associated with the imposition of alien categories. As alien culture, colonial modernism is itself a consciously learned and adopted by the colonial other. It becomes part of the other's mentality, his way of thinking and judging. Categories are transferred from the setting in which they were fashioned without regard to their suitability in an alien context. Categories are also modes of creating and controlling. Foucault showed us how categories embedded in discursive formations, in speech forms, in instruments of sorting, registering, classifying, can function as quotidian modes of power, ideal typical dichotomies representing themselves as ways to analyze phenomena in systematic manner, slip into our stereotypes. The East is fatalist, says Max Weber, the West agentic. The non-West conveys status by birth, says Talcott Parsons, the West by achievement. The non-West is childlike, says John Stuart Mill, the West mature. Dominant peoples use ideal types and stereotypes to control the dominated. Feminist, scholar, feminist scholarship has provided a rich array of stereotypes, especially from 19th century English literature. The hysteria of women versus the sanity of men. The idealism of women versus the realism of men. These dichotomies remind us that effective categories capture enough of reality to make them credible, even while they falsify reality in the service of the necessary hierarchies of domination. Louis Hartz, whose liberal tradition in America was published in 1955, continues to influence how many Americans think about their nation and history. Hartz did not precisely warn America, American social scientists, that they were unfit to understand foreign societies. But he did observe that Americans in general bore a particularly heavy intellectual burden as they approached the alien other. That burden was a Lockean universalism, a Lockean universalism that taught that the self and the other were the same because they shared a common human nature. The assumption that all persons share common humanity is one of the normative glories of liberalism. Lockean universalism asserts the equal worth and common reason of all humans. As the preamble of the U.S. Declaration of Independence put it in 1776, quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. But this presumption of sameness obliterates difference when it, craze, when it erases the, the markers that distinguish cultures and peoples and create identity and meaning. Survey research concepts and methods circa 1957 took for granted that other cultures too were constituted by Lockean individuals. Writing in the liberal tradition of America, Hartz explored the negative face of liberalism. He spoke of the moral unanimity arising among Americans foundational belief in Lockean universalism and of their often dangerously irrational devotion to it. Americans Im imagine the impulses and definitions of their worldview are universal because they take them to be self-evident. Hartz attributed this belief in the self-evidence of rights and reason to American historical experience, an experience epitomized Mm -hmm. 
epitomized in the quote from Tocqueville that Hartz used to open his book. The great advantage of the American is that he has arrived at a state of democracy without having to endure a democratic revolution, and that he is born free without having to become so. The experience of being born free means that Americans did not experience radically different ideologies and institutions. They did not have to struggle against feudal oppression and feudal survival or the absolutism envisioned by Thomas Hobbes or Robert Filmer. They did not experience the status orders and class differences that shaped Europe's history. Being born free without having to become so produces, in Hartz's view, a complacent liberalism, a liberalism unlike Europe's, which imagines itself as both revolutionary and embattled. According to Hartz, American liberalism lacks the philosophic spark, the sense of relativity, the self-consciousness, and reflexivity of European liberalism. Having been born free, Americans assume that the whole world is eager for a similar condition. Hartz argues that the Lockean liberal consensus It'll come, eventually. Okay. That's the one I haven't read. That's the one you haven't read? That's who yeah. Hearts argues that the Lockean liberal consensus elicits an impulse to impose lock everywhere. In his Liberalism and Empire, Uday Singh Mehta extends the critique of liberalism beyond a parochial American context. He tells us that not only John Locke, but also James and John Stuart Mill, both officers in the East India Company, as well as their British compatriots, Jeremy Bentham and Thomas Babington Macaulay, did not confront the anomaly inherent in liberalism's exclusion of entire categories of humanity from doctrines for which they claimed universality. The great flowering of liberalism in 19th century Britain paralleled the great years of the empire. Meta shows that liberal doctrines were not only made compatible with illiberal colonial rule, but used to justify it. They did so on the basis of a theory of infancy that was used to characterize those portions of humanity that had yet to ascend the maturity generating evolutionary path. Childhood is a quote, childhood is a theme that runs through the writings of British liberals on India with unerring unerring constancy. It is the fixed point underlying the various imperial imperatives of education, forms of governance, and the enlightenment with progress. 19th century liberalism's understanding of the colonies, like much of 20th century modernization theories, understanding of new nations, depended on a historical anthropology of earlier and later that coincided with lower and higher, backward and advanced. A lower position on the historical timeline entails an absence of the capacity to reason, which makes deliberation and self-government possible. As John Stuart Mill put it, quote, liberty as a principle has no application to any state of things anterior to the time when mankind have become capable of being improved by free and equal discussion. Until then, there's nothing for them but implicit obedience to an Akbar or Charlemagne, if they're so fortunate as to find one. This theory of historical infancy served 19th century liberalism as the rationalization for and justification of empire. Kipling captured the theory in the phrase, the white man's burden. Meta's countervailing presence to Locke is Edmund Burke. Burke rejected liberal universalism, the doctrine that all humanity is the same everywhere and always. 
if universalism and historical evolutionism of 19th century liberals anticipates modernization theory, Burke speaks for the epistemological position of contemporary area scholarship that credits and values difference. He rejects a featureless and abstract liberal universalism for its failure to grasp how territory and person are marked by particular and specific histories and, and cultures. I turn now to the liberal universalism assumed, how liberal universalism assumed the guise of modernization theory. Modernization dominated comparative politics used in the 1950s and 60s to analyze and explain post-colonial societies. As a coherent set of concepts, modernization theory has been subject to challenges such as dependency theory of the 1970s, post-colonial critique of the 1990s. But modernization theory's central premise and promise, the reproduction of Western modernity, endures as a theme in American social science and public policy. Modernization theory arose out of the structure functional systems theory pioneered by Talcott Parsons in sociology and emulated by David Easton and Gabriel Allman in political science. System theory's macro totalizing claims purported to explain all. As Parsons told the faculty committee on behaviorism, at Harvard in 1954, quote, a long-term program of scholarly activity which aims at no less than a unification of theory in all fields of behavioral sciences is now envisioned. A long-term program is now envisioned. For modernization theorists, world history moved toward a progressive future. It was driven by an inner reason or dynamic that moved in linear, or dialectic fashion toward a climax. For modernization theorists, world history moved toward a progressive future. It was driven by an inner reason, a dynamic that moved in linear or dialectic fashion toward a climax represented by the industrialized West. In this sense, the West, and more particularly the United States, was seen to show the nations of the world their future. Modernization theory represented an extension of the liberal historicity we have already discussed, a scientized, objectivized version of the value-laden concepts of James and John Stuart Mill, who viewed the world's peoples as backward or advanced, and as civilized or uncivilized. So we uh, carry on with the, oh yes, let's change the mic. So I'm, I'm continuing with this uh, critique of modernization theory. <clears throat> Talcott Parsons and Edward Schills's pattern variables proved a most seductive way to managing the burgeoning project of modernization theory. They propose a series of oppositional dyads to organize the social universe of the modern West and its traditional other. These dyads, ascription versus achievement, affectivity versus affective neutrality, Collectivity orientation versus self-orientation. Particularism versus universalism. Diffuseness versus specificity. The items on each side of this dichotomous construction were considered to be systematically related. The left side of the pattern variables represented the traditional world that was to be superseded the right side, the modern world that was being realized. The teleological cast of the framework mandated movement towards a necessary future. The march of history offered only two possible outcomes, the high road of modernity and the dustbin of history. 
Nobody drove this agentless process. There was no suggestion of multiple modernities or multiple traditions, much less their mutual penetrations. The Parson Schill's pattern variables implicitly pitted Anglo-American institutions against those of the developing world and laid out a path by which progress meant the Anglo-Americanization of the colonial other. The Parson Schill's paradigm became hegemonic in the social sciences of the later 1950s and in the 1960s and 1970s. All possible permutations of action could be accounted for. Quote, we maintain, wrote Parsons and Schills, that there are only five basic pattern variables and that in that sense, uh, they are all of the pattern variables which derive and they constitute a system, end quote. The system's paradigm profoundly influenced the committee on the comparative politics of, on, on Committee on Comparative Politics of the U.S. Social Science Research Council, formed in 1954. Gabriel Almond, who chaired the committee, spoke for a broad theoretical consensus when he asserted that the concept of systematic coherence, quote, codified my own implicit paradigm of the interdependence of the components of politics, end quote. Coherence had several implications. If the future of the modern system were interlocked and non-detachable, developing polities or societies had no choice but to buy into the whole basket. They were, there was no, there was to be no fashioning of modernity inflected by particular histories, no picking and choosing, no more or less. Not only were developing societies expected to transition to the predetermined ensemble of Western modernity, but they were also to discard the equally coherent contrasting features into the dustbin of history. Mixed states, hybrids, and their occupants were transitional, incomplete, unstable, either on their way to modernity or failures incapable of completing the journey. Dichotomies are logical structures that suppress the intermediary ground where most of the world exists. Yet it was from intermediary ground that the multiple modernities of Western Europe and East Asia were created. There was nothing uniform about the history of those modernities, no master narrative that explained them all. The factors that led to the modernizations of England, France, Germany, the United States, Japan, were contingently, not systematically, related. Our quarrel with the dichotomies was that they misunderstood how social change occurred. Most change occurs by adaptation, in incrementally. Particular features of tradition persist, though often modified, into modernity. Tradition is not an unbreakable package, nor is modernity. The components of each are capable of recombination. Individualism may not fully replace collective forms of sociability and action. And despite the deep personalization wrought by the modernizing process, in many societies, group solidarities and other forms of institutionalized affect resist affective neutrality. Particularly mixes of timing and circumstance continue to mark the difference among modern societies. Adaptation has enabled a plurality of modernities. Now the next topic is new generations of universalism. New generations of universalism have washed over modernization theory. Rational choice and globalization bring similar assumptions to analysis. In the social sciences, the propensity to imagine that the world is the same everywhere and always is most prominent among economists. When George Stigler and Gary Becker argued in De Gustibus Non Es Putandum that there, were not o that there were not any theoretically significant differences of taste among human agents, they articulated a liberalism that erased variation. 
By the 1980s, formal theory was migrating out of economics into political science in the guise of rational choice. It brought with it the universalism embedded in microeconomics. It also brought with it microeconomics' methodological individualism. It seems that rational individuals are universally motivated to maximize utility. Rational choice's disdain for the collective and the particular does more violence than did modernization theory to scholarship that aims to distinguish and characterize cultures and societies. Modernization theory at least had a differentiated vocabulary to characterize the other, a vocabulary that recognized alternative social and ideal attributes. Rational choice inquiry and explanation replaces alternative formulations of motive and identity with a uniform, singular concept of utility maximization. According to Amartya Sen in his article, Rational Fools, quote, a person is given one preference ordering. And when, that, and when the need arises, this is supposed to reflect his interest, represent his welfare, summarize his idea of what should be done, and describe the actual choices and behavior. Can one preference do all these things? Economic theory has been much preoccupied with this rational fool decked in the glory of his one all-purpose preference ordering. To make room for the different concepts related to this behavior, we need a more elaborate structure." End quote from Amartya Sen. Theoretically, most relevant to our earlier discussion of Lockean liberalism universalism is the propensity for formal theory to attribute motives rather than to investigate them. The assumption that actors' preferences and choices are determined solely by calculations of rational self-interest is problematic, not only because it ignores the role of sentiment, passion, and commitment in behavior, <clears throat> not only because rationality itself is scarce rather than ubiquitous, but also because it is diversely defined by different cultures. Now, uh, I'm going to discuss area studies as a counter movement. Area studies was originally an American bureaucratic construction, an artifact of the Cold War. <clears throat> In 1958, the U.S. Congress passed a National Defense Education Act that funded area studies. President Eisenhower and the Congress thought the country needed, among other things, languages and area knowledge to carry out the struggle against communism. Area studies provided a vehicle for stockpiling area experts, a metaphor whose military ring was not accidental. Area studies legislation and funding and the academic programs that followed suffers from a contradiction. The narrative used to get the National Defense Education Act passed was bellicose. Language and area knowledge were needed to defend against the U.S.'s Cold War enemy, the Soviet Union. But the scholars who entered area studies, with the possible exception of scholars of the Soviet Union, largely brought to the task a benign curiosity and eagerness to understand the other in East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, and Africa. Academic entrepreneurs were happy to ride the bellicose wave into bigger departmental budgets for esoteric specialties and languages that would not ordinarily be federally funded. Clever deans, collaborating with professors of Sanskrit, Arabic, and Chinese, built programs of study provided uh, and provided academic appointments and fellowships for enthusiastic scholars eager to spend time among and learn about and from the other. Area scholars were sometimes accused of being a kind of shadow embassy for the countries they studied. National Security Advisor and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger advocated the transfer of area specialist foreign service officers out of the countries they knew best. He sent his entourage from circumstances on the ground.
What many area study scholars had in common with Burke was their respect for the dignity, worth, and meaning of the other. That respect could not be enacted except by a recognition of the specificity of the other. Area scholars learn to enter into the life of the other under, uh, under cer certain circumstances even to become the other. They resisted the practice of subsuming the particular subspecies aeternitatis, or treating local thought and practice as instances of some abstract universal. This characterization of the area scholar would hardly have proved capable, credible to the most notable of the power shapes knowledge proponents, the late Edward Said. At the time he published his best known work, book, Orientalism, he believed in Aji's Ahmed's effective summary that anyone, quote, anyone who teaches, writes about, or researches the Orient is an Orientalist. Orientalism is a Western style for dominating, restructuring, and having authority over the Orient. Despite the fact that Said nuanced his position in subsequent writings, this critique became common among post-colonial writers, both those who lived in the colony and who lived outside it. Post-colonial theory bears a complex relationship to area studies. Post-colonial theorists often combine the critical edge of Marxist vocabulary with a respect for cultural determinants that Marx would have disdained. They are as likely to be found in English or comparative literature departments as in the social sciences. Post-colonial scholars disrespect and transgress boundaries. They are post-colonial in that they attack the justifying prose of imperial and para-imperial authors. And in some cases, such as Ronald Inden, question the capacity of several generations of American scholars of India to present Indians as autonomous actors capable of creating their own social worlds. Heirs of Foucault and Said, they lament the corruption of power and the fatal intermeshing of power and knowledge. Some see area scholars, especially, especially American area scholars, as the running dogs of corporate exploitation or an oppressive state. Some, however, see them as a perspicacious eye of a post-colonial generation willing to pay cultural reparations for the offenses of, the Western, of Western colonialism and to counter the cultural imperviousness of an imperial United States. The language we used above, dignity, respect, suggests that what is at stake is not just an abstract methodological question, but rather a worldview and commitment. This is terrain on which area scholars and epistemological universalists meet and quarrel. Epistemological disputes in contemporary social sciences remind us that scholars often invest their chosen modes of inquiry with a moral aura. At its extremes, area scholars regard methodologies that do not recognize specificity and context as immoral because they objectify the other and erase the other's humanity. Those who practice such methodologies, the formal modelers and large end scholars looking for data, advocate what might be characterized as a petrol pump theory of area scholarship. Area scholars are expected to spend years and years mastering one or more languages and doing years of research in the field often under adverse circumstances, in order to provide the data sets that modelers and large-end scholars can pump into their formulas and equations. Their approach towards scholarship is purely utilitarian, ex exploiting knowledge of the other as the quote, raw material of hypothesis testing. A leading exponent of the petrol pump theory of area scholarship is Robert Bates, an outspoken Harvard professor whose views, if realized, would impose universalism on the other in the guise of science. 
Social scientist Bates tells us, seek to identify lawful regularities which must not be context bound. They reject the presumption that political regularities are area bound. Yet area scholarship has found itself under attack for inattention to comparative approaches that can generate general theories, especially theories of causality. Hypothesis testers castigate area scholarship for being lost in pointless exchanges about incommensurability. Truths of my village versus the truths of your villages. Exchanges that yield anecdotal specificity but do not produce explanations. A standard area defense that the researcher is exposing the unique qualities of the subject area is countered by the assertion that even uniqueness depends on comparison. Area studies is under attack too from another generation of universalists, the globalists, many of whom see regional worlds converging on a single pattern. Some globalists see area studies as freezing existing regional and national identities instead of examining how these identities are being transformed by global processes. Area studies, they say, emphasizes, quote, relatively immobile aggregates of traits with more or less durable historical boundaries and with a unity composed of more or less enduring propensities, end quote. Such Static aggregates are affected by the new mobility, a mobility which destabilizes the old national and regional objects of research and attends to new markers of fluidity, trade, travel, pilgrimage, warfare, proselytization, colonization, exile, and the like, end quote. The recent vogue in globalization studies is welcome insofar as it highlights the transnational world's that state-centric political science and some area scholarship have neglected. But globalization studies often fail to confront the society and politics of the other on the presumption that homogenizing global processes will make local knowledge irrelevant. Not yet. Those civilization and cultural entities that area scholars examine are not going to lose their distinctiveness even when the natives wear jeans drink Coke, watch television, and surf the web. Now I turn to the situated knowledge as an alternative to universalism. Uh, if modernization theory and other universalist schemes such as formal modeling, large end studies, <clears throat> and rational choice and globalization studies <clears throat> use concepts and categories fashioned out of the Anglo-American experience and deny difference by not recognizing the autonomy, authenticity, and agency of the other. What epistemology is likely to do so? In our view, an alternative to universal knowledge, knowledge that is said to be true everywhere and always, is situated knowledge. Knowledge that is shaped by time, place, and circumstance. Situated knowledge proceeds from specificities and works upward and outward to comparative generalizations rather than downward from a priori assumptions. We may characterize situated knowledge by the way it makes projections about the future. Universalistic theories project a single history common to mankind, a common developmental path along which all humans will tread. Situated knowledge, by contrast, projects futures by reference to where a culture or society or polity is coming from. Its specificities shape the next step. When Karl Marx noted in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon that, quote, men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances but under circumstances already existing. He signaled the importance of context and the limits on historical agency. The circumstances existing already that Marx spoke of are of a Burkean sort. They are limits posed by a country's or a people's ancient constitution, in Burke's phrase. Despite Marx's caveat that men don't make history as they please, 
we must recognize he nevertheless shares modernization's theory, theory's projection of a single history for mankind. The way Burke thought of historical agency, positing that futures grow out of pasts and opens the way to multiple histories, multiple paths, multiple modernities, and multiple traditions. We can also characterize situated knowledge by the modes of inquiry it favors. Causality and meaning are at the center of two fundamentally different modes of inquiry. Causality, the relationship between cause and effect is based on objective knowledge and calls for observation and measurement. Meaning, how humans perceive and understand the world is based on subjective knowledge and calls for interpretation. The Geertzian questions, if I wink, do I intend to let you in on a conspiracy? Am I trying to seduce you? Have I got a sand in my eye? Do I have a, uh, do I have a tick? Are answered by the need for meaning to make observed behavior intelligible. And now I conclude very quickly. The Americans impulse to impose a lock everywhere on, on a world presumed to be eagerly waiting to receive it has by no means expired. It became starkly evident when America moved towards exporting its liberal values by force. In November 2003, then President George W. Bush told his audience at the National Endowment for Democracy, quote, the United States has adopted a new policy a forward strategy of freedom in the Middle East. The advance, this is quotes, the advance of freedom is the calling of our time. It is the calling of our country. From the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson, to the four freedoms of Franklin Roosevelt, to the speech at Westminster by Ronald Reagan, America has put our power at the service of principle. We believe that liberty is the design of nature we believe that liberty is the direction of history, end quote. Since Bush's war of choice to advance freedom in the Middle East, the U.S. has learned that war in Iraq, Afghanistan, against Al-Qaeda, and terrorism more generally, does not advance the cause of freedom. The question is, has America's encounters over the past decade with the other in the Middle East and elsewhere in the world the election of an internal other, an African-American president named Barack Hussein Obama, and America becoming a nation where minorities and internal other are becoming the majority, has it succeeded in giving Americans that, quote, sense of relativity, that spark of philosophy, that reflexivity that will enable them to recognize and respect the unfamiliar and the strange it finds in other peoples and cultures? Or will it, as the rise of the Tea Party suggests, intensify, as it often has in the past, a liberal absolutism, frightened of and hostile to difference? And that's the end.